You are there, ladies and gents. How's it going? Paddy Outback, who's a very awesome motor vlogger in Australia from Ireland, um, he uh, challenged me to uh, list the bikes I've owned and uh, a little story about each of them. Now, I've been riding a little bit longer than Paddy has, um, and my list of bikes is a bit longer than his. But I'm going to put a link to Paddy's video in the description below this, and also I'll put a link to his channel at the end of the video too. Um, but yeah, yeah, so um, the bikes I have had, the bikes I have had, yeah, it's been quite a few. Keep that bike from down. Um, so yes, what have we had? I started off when I was 16, my old man bought me a little 50cc moped, um, it was a Honda MT5. I'll try and put some sort of pictures up and stuff if I can science the maths and make magic happen, um, but if I can't, I, I can't. Um, but yeah, I had a Honda MT5 which was brilliant. Um, I was living at the time down in Horsham which is um, in West Sussex in the UK and I was going to school in Leatherhead which was in Surrey. So, because I was staying at my dad's, I couldn't get home unless I went home with him and he always used to work late. So uh, yeah, it was really awesome having that moped. It meant that I could actually get home from school, um, which was brilliant. And also as I left school, it meant I had a little bit of mobility then too. Um, so it was probably the most awesomest present anyone could have ever bought me. And it introduced me to motorcycles. Um, well, sort of. Uh, I remember riding up the road on the petrol tank on my dad's motorbike when I was about that tall. Um, yeah, awesome stuff. Maybe a picture here of that. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that was brilliant and I had that for a little while and then I moved on. I moved up in the world and I got a Honda 8, uh, not Honda H100, a Honda CB100N, which was brilliant. All my mates at the time, well not all my mates, but a few of my mates at the time were riding around on 125s and I had this little 100cc thing and I was like, oh man, it's, it's going to suck, it's going to suck. All their 125s were restricted and my little 100cc thing wasn't. So they all went around roughly the same sort of speed, but mine was more fun because I was having to work harder for it. <laughs> um, I loved that little bike, it was brilliant. Uh, I passed my test on that. Um, technically, actually, it was a different bike I passed my test on, but uh, yeah, we won't go into exactly what happened there on camera. <laughs> um, but yes, that, that little bike was awesome and uh, Onwards and upwards, as my motorcycle career progressed, I got myself a uh, Kawasaki AR125, which I managed to stack into my college fence um, quite amazingly. Um, I wasn't able to walk away from that one. <laughs> it's in a wheelchair for a little bit um, and uh, on crutches and stuff after that and uh, yeah, broken wrists and stuff. That wasn't the best moment in my life. Um, after I recovered from that incident, uh, yeah, we got the bike all back up and running and then some tow rag, some little scum, uh, stole it um, right from under my nose pretty much. And uh, yeah, yeah, that kind of pretty much broke my heart that day. I, was, I didn't have a lot of money at the time, so replacing it didn't seem something that was very likely to happen. But time moved on and I did replace it. We got me a Yamaha RD125LC. We bought it in buckets. It was literally a rolling chassis and buckets of bits. Um, and my dad helped me piece that together and get it all working. And it was awesome. It was bright yellow. And uh, oh, we one of the sprockets snapped on it. So we put on uh, one of the other sprockets that was in the bucket. And that turned out that bucket had bits of DT125 in there. Um, so we put on DT125 gearing and this thing was just wheeling all over the place. It was just stupid. It was an insane little motorcycle. For a little 125, it was fantastical, it was fantastical. Um, but yeah, I blew that one up as, as most people do when they have RDs. <laughs> um, and uh, what did I go for after that? Uh, I think it was a Kawasaki KMX200, I think. That was the next one, um, which uh, sort of green lane, dual sport type thing, two stroke. And uh, yeah, that was brilliant fun as well, 200cc. So a little bit more grunt than the 125s, um, but not stressed at doing it because like the 125s were having to tune up and stuff like that to get anywhere close to that sort of power. Uh, but yeah, it was grand, it was grand. Um, uh, but it turned out that that bike had been stolen and recovered. I bought that from my local motorcycle shop. Um, 
we won't go into names here, but they're still running in this town I live in. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it, it was an honest mistake. They didn't realise, and this was before the internet where it was easy to do HPI checks and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, yeah, they sold me a bike that it was stolen, recovered, and didn't tell me so, um, which I was very annoyed about because obviously I paid top price for it. And when I sold it, because then I knew that it had been stolen, I had to uh, disclose that, which meant I got bottom price for it, which kind of sucked. Um, but yeah, yeah, that was that was the way it went then. Um, but yeah, I sold that on, and I got myself a my first sort of sports bike, a uh, Honda VFR 400, the NC24, and I thought it was gorgeous. It had single sided swing arm and uh, all the race fairings and stuff like that. Actually, it was a bit of a dog, <laughs> and it drank battery fluid. Um, yeah, by the time I got rid of that, I think I was having to replace the battery almost every other month. Uh, yeah, it was a ridiculous bike, um, but yeah, that was a great bike. I crashed that one outside college as well. Same college, just different side of the road. Um, yeah, yeah. Wheelies, they're not cool. <laughs> and they don't impress anyone when you fall off. <laughs> um, yeah, so that was the VFR 400 and uh, that was my introduction to faster bikes and it was quite spectacular. Um, and then what did I get after that? Uh, I, ah, I bought my brand new, first brand new motorcycle. I got myself a Ducati M750 Monster, which was the last of the single front disc versions. Um, it was in Ducati red and it was awesome, awesome bike. I mean, I gave that bike some stick. It went through flood water. It, 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 I mean, it, I rode it all the way through the winter. Um, it was a daily driver for me. And by the time I sold it, it looked an absolute state. But it got me through, never had any of the Italian electrical gremlins that everyone told me it was going to have. Uh, yeah, the paint peeled a little bit um, because it had the stupid flippy uppy side stand things that uh, Ducati had at the time. And the moment you took weight off them, the side stand would flip up. And it also had a small footprint on the side stand. So when you put that down on tarmac in the summer, it would sink into the tarmac, the bike would lean and roll forward and it would just fall off the side stand. Um, yeah, brilliant design. <laughs> I really loved that bike, it was great, little air-cooled thing, um, but uh, yeah, couldn't keep it forever. Um, and I joined the Navy and they told me I owed too much money to everyone, so I had to clear some debts. And they didn't think I was going to be able to afford to run the Ducati uh, on apprenticeship wages, because when I joined the Navy, I joined as an apprentice, which worked out about 50 quid a week or something like that. Rubbish, rubbish, rubbish. Um, so I sold that. And then they changed all the rules and gave us minimum wage. <laughs> so I could have afforded to keep it. But I didn't have time to ride it because I was learning all new Navy things. And uh, yeah, so <laughs> um, yeah, I was, I was sad to see it go, but it, it had to be done and it changed my life joining the Navy. So it was all good, it was all good cause. Um, after a little while in the Navy, I saw my wages went up as I got promoted to uh, leading hand and uh, I got myself another bike. I got myself a second hand Honda CBR 600. It was the last of the carved bikes um, and it was a rocket as far as I was concerned. I'd never ridden anything as fast as that um, and I rode it as fast as it would go quite often. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I didn't look after it particularly well. By the time I traded it in, I actually traded it in for a car. By the time I traded it in, you could spin the, the chain on the sprocket because there was no teeth left on it and stuff. Um, but yeah, I mean, it wasn't ever a brilliant bike anyway. Um, it was fast for me, but it, it wasn't, wasn't a brilliant bike. And uh, I was kind of glad to see it go, to be honest. Um, and like I said, I got a car then uh, for a bit and I got a girlfriend and the girlfriend didn't like motorcycles and Every weekend when I went to see her, I'd be like, I want a motorcycle. She was like, no. Nope. <laughs> so uh, under the thumb a little bit there, I think that's where I got this ball patch from. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so uh, no bikes for a couple of years. Um, but we split up. It was mutual. It was sad. Um, uh, I loved it a bit, but it wasn't ever going to work out. But it was great because it got me a Triumph 1050 Speed Triple, uh, one of the first of the 1050s, and that was an amazing bike, uh, such a brilliant motorcycle. I love that bike. Um, and through having that bike, I, I met a load of other motorcycle type people um, and my whole biking life expanded. And I was like, wow, it's not just about riding around the same road all the time by yourself. It was like group rides and meetups and stuff like that. So it was fantastic. And uh, I was also based in Cornwall at the time. 
Um, so I rode the bike down there a few times and met up with a bunch of people down there as well. Um, and it was an amazing, amazing time in my biking life. So some fantastic roads down Cornwall, tearing around them, um, racing sports bikes and stuff. Uh, yeah, it was a good bike that was, it was a good bike. Uh, but because I was surrounded by people on sports bikes, um, they persuaded me to do a track day. Um, I didn't want to do it on my Triumph, I didn't think it was the right sort of bike for it. So I hired a bike and uh, last lap of the last session, high sided and broke my back and pelvis. Yeah, brilliant, good move, good move. But fortunately I didn't break my bike because I hadn't used it, awesome stuff. And uh, yeah, by the time I'd recovered I'd already bought myself a Suzuki GSX-R750, um, a K7 Phantom, which was lovely. Um, to scratch my sports bike itch and uh, even before I was back at work I'd done another track there, I'd done Brands Hatch on that and uh, yeah, well and truly hooked, it was awesome bike, I love that GSX-R, it was a Gixa, not a Gixa <laughs> oh, that might cause some people to comment, Gixa, Gixa <laughs> uh, so yeah, I rode that around, did track days on it and stuff, I even had track fairings and different petrol tank and all sorts of stuff um, and that was so much fun and a, a bit of a mental, mental time for road riding as well. Um, yeah, we won't go into the sorts of stuff that we got up to, but it was it, it was fast and exciting and uh, it, was a, it was a good giggle and no one got hurt, thankfully. Um, but yeah, I'm older and wiser now. <laughs> older. <laughs> uh, so yeah, the, the Gixxer, I, I kept the Triumph as well for a little while, but I realised I was using it less and less, and when I did ride it, I tried riding it the same as I was riding the Gixxer, and you, you, you couldn't do it. it. It wasn't a sports bike, and I was tying it up in knots trying to make it do the things I wanted it to do. Uh, so I sold the Triumph and um, kept the Gixxer for a little while, and uh, what did I do then? Oh, I think one of my mates persuaded me to do a Yamaha off-road experience. Uh, down at Golding Barn um, and by the end of the day, I didn't even want to do it, but by the end of the day I was doing jumps about two and a half metres, well not two and a half, about two metres tall off the, off the deck, I'm sure it must have been at least two metres off the ground we were, we were jumping these bikes, um, clearing tabletops and stuff and I was like hooked. Uh, so as soon as I finished that and got home and my brain had calmed down, I went to my local dealership and ordered myself a no, I didn't. I got it from up north somewhere. Um, I, I got myself a KTM EXE 250F, the four-stroke version. Um, and, uh, yeah, put that in a van and drove it back home. And I loved it. It was brilliant. It opened my eyes to off-roading and I learned a few green lanes and stuff like that. Um, but I just never really gelled with that bike particularly. It just it didn't strike a chord with me in the way I'd wanted it to. A friend of mine at the time had a KTM EXE 125 and I'd borrowed that a few times and I had so much more fun on that. Um, but I didn't have the money to trade it at the time and uh, I wanted other road bikes as well. So hang on, I've got to refer to my notes here <laughs> because there's been a few bikes. Um, yeah, so uh, had the bug of off-road riding um, but it was awkward to do unless you had a van, which I did at the time, but it, it, it just it, it wasn't that accessible for me at the time, even though I lived very close to where I live now. Uh, I didn't have the same network of dirt bikey people. Um, but anyway, I got myself a supermoto thinking, yeah, well, I like this riding style, let's do it on the road. Uh, so I got myself a KTM, is it LC4 or something like that? A 640 SM, SM C4 or something, I, I can't remember, 640 KTM, a really big, heavy, rubbish, rubbish bike. I mean, I hated it, I really hated it. Uh, and I flipped that outside Debenhams, putting wheelies, don't do them, it's stupid. Bikes land on your balls and you end up ripping tendons in your shoulder and having to have an operation. Great. <laughs> uh, so, yes, that one went because it was a big, lardy bucket of boring. And I traded that in for a Husqvarna SM510R, which was an amazing, amazing bike. I'm literally verbal diarrheaing here, aren't I? Verbal diarrheaing. You've probably all switched off. But the SMC, sorry, the, the SM510R was just an incredible bike. And I took that up to Scotland. I didn't ride it up there. I, I put it in a van. And uh, I was riding that up there on the far trails. And uh, I even sort of touring some of like the, uh, what do they call it, the NC500. Not all of it, but... Um, yeah, I strapped a jerry can, five litres of fuel to the back of the bike 
and off I went. Um, you needed that five litres because the tank would only get you about 50 miles till the, it was empty. <laughs> so uh, yeah, that was brilliant, really good bike. Um, I, I actually regret selling that one or trading that one in because it was, it was brilliant. Did track days on it, green laning on it and touring, touring. <laughs> uh, yeah, brilliant bike, brilliant bike. Very uncomfortable with its plank of a seat and stuff, but um, yeah, yeah, I love that. And uh, it was awesome on track, it really was, it really was. Biting the ankles of sports bikes around Brown Sachs Indy. <laughs> um, but that one went, um, it was starting to have gearbox problems, so I was going to probably end up having to get it rebuilt and stuff anyway. So, uh, yeah, yeah. So the SM510 went and uh, I traded that in for what at the time I thought was going to be my dream motorcycle. Um, in all the pictures of it, while I'd been on patrol, I'd been lusting after this gorgeous beast of a motorcycle, bright red, aggressive, um, yeah, it had all the toys, traction control and ABS when that was a new thing. Um, yeah, a Ducati Street Fighter 1098, and I got the S version with all the Olin stuff, and I covered it in carbon fibre, um, trying to make it nicer. But it was a bloody awful motorcycle. The engine on it was just insane. 160 brake horsepower on a naked bike. And that wouldn't be out of place with the current crop. And this was, I don't know how many years ago, but about, about 10 years ago maybe? Don't know, around that era. Um, so yeah, 160 brake horsepower naked bike. And it, yeah, the, the, the engine on it was insane. But trying to get it to go around corners, it just wouldn't do it. Uh, even in the instruction manual, it said brake hard, turn, accelerate. It didn't like flow. There was no nothing about it that flowed around corners, and I just didn't get on with it. It was a bit tall for me. I find Ducatis generally are, and it was a bit long for me as well, and it was so uncomfortable. Um, so my dream bike was no longer my dream bike. Uh, so it's never fulfil your fantasies. I think that's the key I learned from that one there. Um, and uh, again, I, I bought it without even sitting on one because my local dealership didn't have one. So I had to order that online um, and have them deliver it down to me. Um, but lesson sort of learned from that. And uh, I decided I needed a different bike. And again, when I was at sea, which is normally what happened when I was on the submarines, I'd sit there looking through all the bike mags, uh, all the bikes I liked and working out what I wanted. And I couldn't decide. I wanted, I wanted a sort of retro style thing, but I also wanted to have a track day bike, something that I could scratch my track day urges with. Uh, so when I traded it in, I saved up a little bit of money um, and I ordered a brand new Moto Guzzi V7 and a brand new Kawasaki ZX636R. And I went for the ABS version as well on that, so I had traction control and ABS, I thought that'd be grand. Um, but that hadn't been officially launched or it, it, it'd been announced and stuff, so I, I put the deposit down on it and I picked that up six months later. But I got the, the uh, Moto Guzzi, which is the Moto Guzzi I've still got now, um, there and then. And uh, yeah, I never really thought I would gel with a bike quite as well as I did with that V7. And uh, I mean, those of you that are new to my channel won't necessarily have seen it, but if, if you've seen some of my track day videos, you'll have seen how much fun I'm having biting the ankles on sports bikes on that. And that was kind of the problem. It was such a good bike. I never rode the Kawasaki. I think I did 2,000 miles on it um, in the time I had it. And I was like, this is an expensive motorcycle. And at the time, the second-hand market for bikes was rubbish. I, I, I couldn't sell it, I couldn't sell it. So I dropped the price, dropped the price, dropped the price. And in the end, um, a lad, he got an absolute bargain. Uh, immaculate motorcycle. Uh, it'd been very well looked after, but it hadn't been used much, so it didn't really need much looking after. Um, yeah, it was such a shame because that Kawasaki was probably the best sports bike I've ever owned, but I just didn't ride it. Um, yeah, sad that was, um, and a bit of a waste of money. But it's what happens, it's what happens. Uh, another lesson, don't buy two bikes at the same time, because one will always be preferred over the other. Excuse me, burping. I was on the wine last night and uh, yeah, <laughs> it's repeating a little on me today. Uh, so yes, the Kawasaki went, the Moto Guzzi stayed and uh, I did a trip around Europe on it and I also did a track day around Brands Hatch. Um, one of my first track day videos on the um, my YouTube channel 
is from uh, that track day. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I was blown away by how good it was on track. And the trip round Europe um, went uh, France, Switzerland, Italy, France, Spain, um, and then back um, from Bilbao. And uh, yeah, that blew me away. And I come back and I've been on such a high from riding around on all these amazing European roads. I come back here to all the potholes and grey weather and I was just like, I don't want to ride anymore. And I pretty much hung up my leathers almost proper, completely for, I don't know, over a year, I think. I, I can't remember exactly, but yeah, I, my bike didn't turn a wheel. Um, and I, I was just like really just disheartened with it because in the UK there was nothing exciting me about riding motorcycles at the time. But um, I don't know what it was, but I got gave myself a kick in the butt. I was like saying, I've got to do something about this or I've got to sell it. Um, we've missed out on a wedge of motorcycles. I had the Yamaha RXS100, which one, I think my first video on my channel is of me telling that on Moto Gymkhana. It was a really ridiculous motorcycle. It was tuned to fuckery. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it, it was a very awesome bike. Um, it wasn't fast, but for a 100cc bike it was fast. And the power band on it was like about that big, but it just like exploding dynamite under your saddle. Um, yeah, so that one was great until I blew a hole in the piston. I actually sold that second hand. I sold that blown up for more than I paid for it when it was fully restored and, and uh, immaculate. Crazy times, crazy times. Um, I also had a, a Yamaha XS400. Um, which was a uh, customised tracker thing, um, see pictures and stuff, uh, and that was great fun. It was like riding a hardtail because the suspension didn't do anything on the rear. It was too highly sprung, but it was it was a looker. It was a great looking bike that was, and uh, a lot of fun to ride. But that engine died on that, and I just I was riding the Gutsy, so I, I didn't really feel the need to um, fix it. Really, <laughs> I'm just going to look at my list and see what else I've missed out on. Uh, Oh no, I think that's it. I think we're okay. Um, but yeah, so I, I'm getting back to the Moto Guzzi um, and getting my love of biking back together again. I kicked myself in the bum and I said, right, I'm either going to sell it or I'm going to customise it. And I had a little bit of cash spare because I hadn't ridden for ages. So I thought, well, let's customise it. And uh, it became Lord Vader. It, slowly transitioned into what it was it took me ages getting the custom shop to do the, the frame shop um, and because of that I was I couldn't get anything else done until they'd done that so I couldn't even get it painted and stuff um, and it, it was almost a whole year that the bike was off the road after I decided I wanted to ride again and I was like damn it <laughs> this is ridiculous uh, but it, it was what it was it was what it was and I got it done um, but it made me realise that one, what I turned it into was completely impractical um, and I couldn't use it in the wet at all because otherwise it looks like a crap with pants. Um, so I needed a second bike. And uh, yeah, that's when I got my KTM 390 Duke. We have missed out a bike. Uh, can't remember where in the timeline it goes, around 2012. Um, or 2011, I bought a KTM 200 EXE Enduro and that was an amazing motorcycle. It was what the 250 wasn't when I had that and uh, it, it excited me. Every time I got on it, it scared me. It was, it was amazing, amazing, uh, far more capable than I'll ever be motorcycle. Um, but sadly, someone decided after just 10 hours on the engine, um, which I'm almost there at on my, my new bike, <laughs> I've only had that like a couple of months <laughs> and we've been on lockdown for half of it. <laughs> um, but yeah, someone decided they wanted it more than me and they didn't want to pay for it so they, they robbed it off me um, and that broke my heart and I vowed never to get another dirt bike after that and I almost again gave up riding um, because it, it just broke my heart, it really did. But um, yes, yes, that was a sad story, That was I, I was very, very upset, it put me in a bad place, put me in a bad place. Um, but yeah, back to the Gutsy. Um, I discovered it wasn't very practical for anything and uh, I was like, right, 
let's get this Ducati Duke. I've been looking at them since they were launched, the old version of them, and test rode one with like 16 miles on it and uh, spat coolant everywhere because I thrashed the hell out of it. Uh, trying to do motor gym kind of things on it <laughs> in a car park just to see what it was like um but yeah i got the 2017 390 duke the facelift and uh really really fun bike i mean mine was a problem child it, it, it's ecu ate itself on the first day um the dashboard filled up with condensation and water so they had to replace that twice um the clutch burnt out uh, without me pulling wheelies I mind I got too old for them now I'm not very good at them so I gave up on them years ago um, the clutch burnt out uh, after under 5,000 miles um, and I just didn't trust it I didn't trust it it was so much fun to ride when it worked but I didn't trust it so um, yeah I was quite glad to see that go in a way and I traded that in for my Triumph 765 which I also still have in my garage the low ride height R version of it and I love that bike. I get on it, my feet touch the ground, and it goes ballistically fast, or fast for me, um, and I'm really happy with it. So I'm probably going to get rid of it at some point. <laughs> um, I don't know, I don't know, um, but we're, we're not on about future bikes here. That may be another video. Um, so yes, the 765, which I've done track days with and ridden it around the country quite a lot, and I've had a lot of fun on it. Um, and although now I'm a multi-bike person, all my bikes get used. The Moda Guzzi doesn't get used unless it's sunny Sunday, lovely days, um, or, or the odd track days or something. Uh, the 765 gets used all the time um, and is an awful lot of fun, it is, it is indeed. But it's not a dirt bike and uh, I really wanted a dirt bike. I kind of finally put the gremlins of having my 200 stolen to bed and uh, I got myself that little beta out 4.0. Um, and I kind of wish I'd kept it and then just learnt how to ride it better because it was a brilliant bike, it was a brilliant bike, no doubt about it and uh, I, I, I would think I will always miss that because it's a proper dual sport it hasn't got a problem with the street miles getting to the lanes and stuff like that um, it's got a decent sized tank so I could actually do miles on it without worrying about running out of fuel and uh, cheap and econo e economic to run um, and uh, yeah the tyres lasted all right as well considering they're proper knobbly so I mean got around 2,000 miles out of them um, yeah it was a great little bike um, but it's gone isn't it <laughs> it's gone I've now got the Beta 390RR or RRS if you live in America and uh, it that's a lot of fun. <laughs> I can't wait for it to be running. I can't wait for the bloody lockdown to be over so I can actually go and ride that thing some more and, and learn how to ride it better and actually start enjoying the power that it's got on the lightweight uh, because obviously I'm going to treat the engine a little bit nicely at the moment while, while I run it in. But I'll be dropping the oil on that soon and then gradually increasing um, how much throttle I'm using or how hard I'm twisting that throttle. So that's, uh, that's my bike history, I think. I think we've gone through them all. Yep, uh, I worked out that I've had 23 bikes that I've owned. I might have missed some, but because I, I think I got given the odd moped and stuff in the past, but I can't really remember. Um, and I had a few projects that I did with my dad as well, which weren't really ever my bike, but I kind of thought they were, sort of. But they, never, they weren't. <laughs> um, but yeah, so 20, 23 bikes in uh, how many years? Um, 29 years, 29 years, and that V7 I've had for seven years now, over seven years, so um, yeah, it's been a good few years, it's been a good few years indeed. Right, while well, we've got you here, if you are still here, please be someone still here, please say hello. <laughs> I've received some mail, i received some mail, um, this one come through today, and I've been waiting on this one to come through for bloody ages, um, and it's from the Gorilla Biker. And this one came through a little while ago um, from Throttle Life by JT, who's a, a new YouTuber. It's a very small channel. Um, he's just doing it because he enjoys the interaction with people. So um, again, there'll be links down below to each of these guys' channels. Um, but Throttle Life by JT, he's a really cool guy. He's, uh, he's, a, he's a cop in America. And um, yeah, uh, he's, he's kind of interesting. He's sort of philosophical. 
<laughs> so anyway, thank you JT, I'm gonna get this open in a second. And thank you Gorilla Biker for finally getting that sent out to me. Right, let's do the parcel, because parcels are exciting. Oh, we've got a porno. Nice American bike magazine of sorts. Oh, that'd be interesting, have a little read of that. Be interested to see how the Yanks do uh, their moto journalism. So um, yeah, I shall have a look at that in a bit. Oh, sweet. New York um, plate. Um, I just actually sent uh, JT uh, some number plates of mine as well. Um, so we, this was kind of a swap thing. Um, but that's really awesome. I'll stick that up. Uh, I, I can't put it on my computer, it won't fit. But I'll maybe do something here because that's where my things have been going um, that other people have sent me as well. So that's flipping awesome. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah, yeah. A little keyring type thing. That's quite cool. That's all made out of um, paracord, I think. That's quite fancy. And a little uh, bikery keyring. <coughs> <coughs> oh, excuse me, Corona. <laughs> and another keyring here. What's this one? Oh, Hard Rock Cafe. <laughs> cool. Awesome stuff. Oh, that's awesome. That's brilliant. Thank you, JT. I think that's. Oh no, there's still some more in there. Oh, awesome. Rochester, New York Police Department. Proper New York copper. And his uh, rank badge there as well. That's fantastic, that is. That's brilliant, mate. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. That's awesome stuff. Just double check that I have got everything. Yes, I have got everything out of it now. That's brilliant, mate. I'm well stoked with that. Um, yes, I will find a way to put them on the wall. Maybe the badge I'll see if I can put on the computer. I don't know because that's very, very cool. Now, Gorilla Biker, let's uh, get this one opened. Ugh, can't get in. It's a right handed envelope and I'm left handed. <laughs> Christmas card. Uh, oh, loads of stickers. Okay, so what we got here? Oh, it's not from Gorilla Biker. Oh my word! I'm so sorry. I've even got the wrong blooming channel up here. That's how rubbish the Gorilla Biker is. He told me he had stickers coming, and I told him I would uh, um, include him on the video. So I'm going to have to get rid of him. Let's get Mayfesto up here instead. <laughs> There he is. So pretend that screen wasn't there before. Gorilla biker, gorilla. <laughs> um, but yes, this is from my festo. Um, and I thought that was a Christmas card because it had the Santa hat, but it's not, it's an Easter card, um, which is very awesome. Um, some cool stickers. Um, my festo is over in the uh, Netherlands, uh, Hollandish biker. So you've got a drift sticker. I think that's um, one of those things that you use your phone for um, and you can go straight to his channel with that, I think. Uh, Mash. Is that Mash is in the motorcycles? Because you went to the bike show, didn't you? Um, awesome stuff, awesome stuff. And then a few of his channel stickers, which I will put one of them up on my uh, PC. That's awesome. I'm really sorry, Mayfesto. Uh, I, I really, I, I assume that that was a gorilla biker sending me the stickers that he's been promising to send me for months. Um, but no, it was from you and very, very awesome, mate. Thank you very much. You're a superstar. Now then, right. I've waffled on a lot. And uh, I'm up to date on his channel. And I'm up to date on his channel. Go and sub to them both. They're awesome. And check out the Gorilla Biker too, he's all right, I suppose. <laughs> Send me my stickers. <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, I hope you're all surviving. I hope uh, this crazy world is going to get better and fix itself very soon. And I hope that all your loved ones are okay too. Now I've heard that some of the channels I follow, um, they've lost people with this corona and that's really, 
that's really sad. So um, yeah, take care everyone. Take care. And keep that bar. Rubber side down. Hey no, you gotta keep that bar. Rubber side down.